Thank you. Um, and let me just say that this is a presentation that's deliberately been developed over the last hour or so, uh, hour and a half, um, because the task I was given was to be here all day and try and discern some themes or some issues or something out of all of what we've heard. That was when I thought there were three or four papers, so let me just uh, tell you that as a starter. And I should have used black print because it's actually quite hard for me, well, heavier, because it's quite hard for me to see this. I'm so let me start anyway, um, just as an introduction to this, by saying it's, it's very hard for me today either to capture elements of everything that I've heard, and I want to especially apologise to speakers who've probably thought, well, she's, God knows what she's doing, she's probably doing emails. No, I've not opened up my emails, I have been taking notes, and then I've been trying to construct a PowerPoint presentation. Particular apologies to the, to the later speakers, and obviously Ian, who's already covered a lot of the points I was going to make in a much more experienced and eloquent manner in the aged care environment. Um, obviously, I had done this prior to this last session, so I haven't been able to capture the last two speakers particularly. The other thing I want to say is it's very hard for me to separate out sort of intellectually what we're talking about from my own self-referencing and self-experience. Um, that is the experience of the death of both of my parents within the last four years and seeing them go through that process and more importantly what led up to their deaths. Um, and reaching 65 myself and having to start to deal with the fact that I've got a seniors card, people regard me as a senior, I'm invited to Grey Matters, my first reaction is Oh, so I'm grey enough now, am I? <laughs> and when people say, what do you do? And I say, well, I've actually retired, but I'm still extremely busy. So here I am on one of my retirement days. Um, the other thing is we have a very diverse audience here today. And I think it's a fantastic opportunity for us to talk to one another. I personally regret, uh, because of my task today, I haven't had a lot of chance for doing a lot of chat. But I think that that's been really good, bringing us together, particularly since I do perceive that we remain in systems that actually increasingly, despite the rhetoric, are siloed and separate and funded in different ways and different places for different purposes. And it's really hard for us to actually come together in any meaningful way in action. We do it well rhetorically, but in action, it's bloody difficult. The other thing is I think it's been a great awareness raising and knowledge building and information sharing day. Um, I've certainly learnt a lot of new things, new angles. I've occasionally, and this got it's possibly in red because that's how I was dealing with it in my notes, NK means new knowledge. <laughs> so if you see NK, that's probably what that is. These themes are not necessarily sequenced because I didn't have time to go through, nor are there typos fixed, so I won't even apologise for that. Just say these are some random thoughts on the day. Clearly the issue of what is old age, Ian has talked a lot about this, so have many speakers. There's a large age, age range in itself of whatever we regard as the beginning of old age and whatever might be the end, and we've heard that there are many people who are going to live to 100 in the next X years. So the person who is 65, as I am, is quite different, has different interests, needs, capacity and involvements to the person who is, say, 85 or 75 or 95. And yet we do tend to lump all of us together. And that's what's so scary about hitting 65. You suddenly are in the group that includes your mothers and your grandmothers and all the people you see who look vaguely older than you, and you're all one big lump. And I think today's been really good at, at starting to unpick that. I think that the other thing about age, whether it's young or old, is that we've got to be thoughtful and remember that chronological age doesn't necess necessarily tell us a lot about what a person can do, who they are, what their life has been, and what their opportunities are or need to be. And I think it's been a good reminder of that. I'm also aware that as different cohorts or different chronological or year groups get older, their prior experience and exposure to different drugs and different opportunities around drugs, both licit pharmaceutical products and illicit drugs, is quite different. So, you know, I was um, exposed to the kind of late 60s, 70s in my early formative adult years. 
That was a time of extraordinary difference with, in relation to drugs. I started working in the end of, at the end of the 60s in an environment where the only drug of concern that ever presented in treatment service that I was in, which was St V's in Melbourne, um, as a social worker slash psychologist, was alcohol. It was the only thing anyone talked about. And so I've lived through the era of alcohol being the dominant drug, alcohol being dropped off the agenda completely for a period of time, or it's, so it seemed, and then sort of back on again, and now it's there with all the other things. So just signalling that people born at different times have had different exposures and have different knowledge, different experience of, and different difficulties, as well as attitudes, to various products that have been available. It's hard to imagine what someone who's been born today will be doing when they're 65 and what drugs that we don't yet know or know about will be available to them and how they might be used, what their legal status will be and so on. So that trajectory is different. My grandmother very occasionally drank alcohol. My mother occasionally drank alcohol and then went through a phase probably where she would have had a drink once a week. Um, and then stopped drinking alcohol in her later years. I'm someone who's been in that era of professional women who are very at risk of drinking every day. So just the role and the women and expectations, very different environment. Oh, and the other point I think about uh, what is old age and what drugs and what are we thinking about is Different subgroups and different people in our community experience the difficulties around drugs in different ways. We've had lots of reminders. Women different to men on a whole lot of both the scientific research but also cultural and social experience, as well as the Aboriginal um, issues around alcohol and drugs and the different life expectancy and the differential, much greater harms in those communities about some of these drugs than for most other populations or subpopulations, etc. So another theme that I picked up is something about I call cultural expectations of our older years. And this is where I think, um, sorry, I've got to keep doing this because I can't quite see. Um, I think when we, this is the self-referencing, when we think about what are the next, for me, X years going to be like, the most immediate reference point is what my own parents' trajectory through this time was. Yet I know as role models, their era was very different to mine. And so Ian made the point, well, we don't have good role models that we can look to in many respects. We have exceptions presented to, to us through the media, extraordinary people doing extraordinary things, but then I really only have my parents or people I've known who've got older and died, or got older and not yet died, um, and yet they have a very different life trajectory to me. So that issue about how we think of our ageing, I think, is quite significant. There are also um, some cohort expectations about rights and responsibilities. That's already been covered, and I think um, there's been a couple of questions to Ian that relate to the different attitudes to rights and responsibilities for different age groups and for different age groups today. Oh, I think Anne it was who mentioned the incentives for living um, and issues around why we would want to live to 100. And is that what we desire? Um, and what are the implications of that? And how do we make, how do we even aspire? What, what's a reasonable aspiration? at different ages. What do we think would be good? What do we think would not be so good? And if we get five or ten years older, will we still think the same? Probably not, I would suggest. I'll try the glasses. Does that help? Um, I think there are some issues around uh, sort of notions of what becomes something we should expect in this rights and responsibilities arrangement. What are some of the things we should expect help with? And what are some of the things that we should just grin and bear? Uh, that notion of this is a natural process of ageing, various aspects of my capacity are going to diminish. When do I call this something that I need help with? Or who do I go to? What sort of help is it? And is health type help what I really should be looking for when I'm experiencing something, some diminution? Or is it something else? Or is it reasonable for me to have time and chance and opportunity and support to reflect on, okay, this is fair enough, 
you know, I've, I've had a pretty good time being able to do that thing, whether it was rock climbing or something like that. And I think it's reasonable that I might not do that now. My example is, can I still get up on the ladder and clean the gutters in the house that I live in, which is out in the bush? Because it has enormous implications for me of where I need to relocate to, just because of the issues around at my age, I shouldn't be climbing ladders. So, you know, it's just little, it can be anything as little as that right through to others. What point should we grin and bear it? What point should we push those boundaries, those risks, those testy things we're told, you shouldn't do that anymore? I, do, I no longer, for example, cross roads when the red, red pedestrian thing's on. I wait till green, even if I can't see any cars, and it drives my husband, who's eight years older than me, crazy, because he just wants to go. He says, look, nothing's coming. I said, you only need to trip, and all the traffic that's coming from those lights will be on top of you. And don't expect me to rush out and save you. <laughs> We've heard a lot today about expectations of healthcare personnel and the complexity of shifting some of the cultural expectations of healthcare personnel around when is it worth doing things. And I think Ian gave good examples of that. You know, were you 20 years younger, we would da 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 da. And some of those sorts of shifting but there's also some other versions of that which would say, do I, in my old, let's say at 80 whatever or at 90 whatever, if I have the opportunity for an extremely expensive procedure that I know will mean, yes, I might be able to afford it, but uh, maybe there are other things that are more important or other people's needs at different ages, even in my own family, how do you make those complex decisions and trade off those kinds of trades? So just signalling that there's a whole lot there, there's some other words you might be able to read. I think the sleep issue, it came up not just in the paper we heard about sleep, but it came up at, at other times. And that raises the issue about, you know, what is normal? What is normal as we age, as we develop, as we develop further in our later years? And how do we know what's normal and how can we normalise what is usual or unusual but okay? So there's this notion that normal might be average, but actually maybe being okay isn't normal, but it's still okay. So it's trying to just start to reframe and rethink the way we actually think about what's okay. Um, I've got a son, sadly, who doesn't get a lot of sleep. He keeps telling me it doesn't matter, he doesn't need it. He's quite happy not to, and I do know that at the age of five, he was already smuggling a torch into the bed and reading under the bed covers, and he probably even then only got four or five hours sleep a night at most. So I have had to accept over time I can't influence that. If I couldn't influence when he was five, I can't when he's 31. So, um, and so it goes. The other cultural expectation, the magic bullet, that there'll be something, there'll be something that I can get, I can fix this, I can recover from this, I can take care of this, I can ensure that everything's okay. Um, I think that sense of approaching end of life, I'm really glad Ian raised that, and how do we maintain some control, some capacity to make decisions for ourselves or be involved in those decisions? as we get closer to our end of life. So I won't spend more time on it. Changes in older years came up. Again, I'm only going to whiz through this because others have spoken eloquently about it. Changes in our roles. There are the obvious things and they've been covered today. But also some people, particularly in the AOD sector, end up taking care of grandchildren, care, are carers of children, and there are some, a whole lot of other reasons, not necessarily only AOD, where older people are responsible for very young people. And I think that's something in the AOD sector we need to be very conscious of and thoughtful about in how we go about providing service and to whom do we owe service. Should those people be supported in the AOD sector, in the childcare sector, in the education sector, somewhere else, or all of the above? Changes in old years in our bodies. Um, we've had some very interesting presentations and I wished I could have been more tuned in to some of those because I was finding them quite fascinating um, and I think that's self-referencing. So every time I'm hearing something, I think, oh yeah, I'm aware of that, or oh yeah, I've got that, or no, I haven't got that yet. <laughs> 
But that issue around changes in the ageing brain, changing, changes in metabolism, changes in our biochemistry, um, those examples of changes in our bodies. Um, in, in that context, some of the issues around exercise or what is it that can build resilience and, capa and maintain capacity and build new capacity in our older years is something we don't hear talked about very much. We hear about deficits. We sometimes hear about how to avoid the deficits. But as I think, I go to three different exercise groups each week. Well, I'm enrolled in three. I only ever get to two a week because one was today, for example. But I go to them with no clue about whether the muscle sections of my body that that one's trying to tone or improve is, is the best I could be doing. Should I be doing more weights? Should I be doing this? Should I be swimming? It's very hard and I don't know who, even who to talk to about that. I'm not sure that my GP will be the best person. I'm not sure, sure that a fitness expert will be the best person. It's sort of like this massive stuff going on out there and yet no clarity about where to go to sort that out. Um, we've also learnt that changes in old years includes responses to medications and I've captured this by just saying ageing complicates medications actions. So we've heard a lot about the differential impact of medications at different ages and stages. For example, a bit of new knowledge, the possibility that methadone is not the best drug to be using for opiate substitution therapy in older years. And, and so I think there's some interesting ideas in that that many of the medicos here might be very aware of, but I certainly was not. So whose perspective do we view older years through and what's our response? Is there a correct response? And I wanted to say, I don't think there's a correct, a uh, correct response. We're talking about diversity here. We're talking about a whole population. We're talking about all of us who are all ageing. And so I don't think we should be looking for where's the menu so I can just say, oh, I'll have that one, that one and that one. It does need to be individualised, does need to be integrated. We've heard about uh, which perspective should we take in responding or thinking through our programs. Is it the person or patient's perspective? Is it the perspective of significant others, especially in including family where they exist, but they don't for all people? Is it the clinician's view about what's important and what's a priority and what should be done or not? Is it societies, which sadly these days, I think as, as Sam's question suggested, is so often looked at in dollars terms and in market sense, the costs of old age. Interestingly, we've had many mentions of costs today in actually very reasonable and appropriate ways. So I have appreciated noting the cost for the acute uh, bed in the acute hospital and them only being paid really about four days of that long length of the patient that um, uh, Paul gave us the example of and the complexity of locating that person. As an early career social worker in a hospital, I know a lot about that kind of issue. I also want to just point out that we haven't today at all talked about ageing people in our correction systems, in prisons and in forensic prisons, um, and they too are another cohort that warrants some thought. I'm not going to spend any time on which drugs we should be talking about. We've heard the spectrum. We've heard many people talk about them. So let me just go to some things I was reminded of in the various presentations today, and I'm sure you could all add to them. Firstly, we've not covered all the bases that we need information-wise, and there is still a need for further research. And that wasn't just researchers saying, we need more research because we need more money. It was people saying, actually, we've got missing information here. We don't know how to answer some of the questions people like me are asking. Secondly, there's an enormous need for information and the sharing of information and conversations. I suspect were Ian here and available for the next four hours, we could have had a four or five hour session with us all just asking all those questions we want to be able to ask and never sure where to take them. So it's an example, I think, of how desperate we are as community members for opportunities to have these conversations. For that, we have to thank Anne and, and NCETA for setting this up and hope for more. 
We've been reminded about the importance of screening and assessments and the need for us to do some sorting out about what are the most appropriate screening instruments and to be careful not to use screening instruments that are not appropriate for older people. But when we do do screening, to actually use the results of that screening, to do some further assessment and to take action. We heard about how in many environments, lots of people ask about drinking, smoking, etc., etc., illicit drugs, but then go on to talk about other things. And they've already got before them plenty of evidence that they should be pursuing that further, offering information, offering advice and interventions. Um, I've mentioned that it needs to be integrated. Uh, we've been reminded about alcohol and that's both risky drinking on a short term or an acute occasion, as well as the long term accumulated lifetime risk of our drinking patterns and that that shifts and we still don't have good information to inform what should the guidelines be at those different ages beyond 65 through to 100. Um, I've been reminded, we've been reminded about the cultural place of alcohol, its problematic location in our society, but also just a reminder, I said before, my grandmother hardly ever drank, my mother drank very occasionally, and I'm someone who's grown up in an era where daily drinking is the norm. So it's an example, I think, of what's gone on in our culture. For women in particular, there's been a much more dramatic change than for men who've always been seen as big boozers. And the SW refers to the buffoon, buffoonery of Shane Warne interviewing all the cricketers in the team following Australia's great win. He was a great cricketer, but I do resent his constant reference to getting pissed. And I just I think that just summarises for me the whole cultural place of alcohol. Um, the last set of reminders, many of our clients and service users are ageing and their needs, their bodies, their cultures, their social environment, the drugs they're using and need are changing and we need to be thoughtful about that. Mental health parallels and co-occurring conditions is something we're familiar with and I think needs a lot more attention and ongoing effort. Prescription of opiates is not necessarily a bad thing. The increase in the availability of opiates, appropriately used for appropriate periods of time for appropriate conditions with appropriate people, is a boon in our community. I've been involved in some international work with my Cancer Council hat on around access to opiates for pain relief and terminal care. The majority of prescription opiates are used in only four countries in the world. And there are many, many, many countries who have no access to any opiates for any purpose. So the issue about us now worried, reasonably, about potential overuse of prescription opiates has to be seen in the context of the enormous number of countries who can't get any of those and where people die in pain. So I think, again, a bit more perspective around this is what we need. Physical assessments, particularly for those who are ageing, is critical. This is a theme I've banged on about for years, that our drug and alcohol services are generally not funded sufficiently well to ensure that every one of our clients, consumers, customers or patients have had a, an appropriate medical assessment. This becomes increasingly critical as our client groups age, where there will be more chronic illness, both independent of and associated with their drug use. And documentation, we've heard about the lack of information. So my ending thoughts. I think that when we're thinking about the sort of care that is needed, we need to remember human responding. And maybe, it's human responding that brings the two sectors, if we are two, I think we're more than that, but two sectors together today. The commitment to actually humanly caring for people is something that's strongly shared between the AOD service <laughs> providers and those in aged care. Because if you didn't have that, you wouldn't be in it. Because it takes a fair bit in both those sectors to hang in there. And I think that's something that this combination, this integration between our sorts of services can really build on and start with. I noticed that Stephen, in his Welcome to Country, made reference of the importance 
of stimulating older people, supporting older people, giving older people a place where they could age, and in his case, where they could die. And I think it's useful for us to be reminded of the importance of that sort of support, that sort of opportunity, that sort of place, wherever it might occur. I think we do need to achieve that, a very different set of ambulatory care to support people if they wish to be in their own homes through that phase of life. We don't really have it well organised at the moment, and I think the AOD sector has to be part of that planning rather than figure, like many in the community, well, that's for those other services, that's for aged care. We need to be in there. Whoops, sorry, I need to go. My last slide, if I can get to it. Roger, given my trouble with seeing. Yeah, here it is. Um, Okay, so my ending thoughts, and this is the last one, because I've got a taxi I've got to walk out of here in five minutes for. I think when we're thinking about this, we can use some concepts in the AOD sector that we've used very frequently before, and that's the intent around reducing harm. Not just reducing harm as in how can we prevent bad things happening, but how can we build resilience and build capacity through every phase of life, including in our older years. So if we change this, instead of saying, how can we just prevent problems that arise, how can we ensure that people confront, live through and experience and enjoy their older years in a manner that they are still building capacity and still building resilience to the problems that will inevitably be, a, be an aspect of their day-to-day -day lives. Um, I, I was very reminded quite a few times today of my very early days and I remember um, not only teaching medical students or at that time medical residents along with David Hill who then went on in the tobacco arena and we were, we were given instructions and the standard then was to say that safe drinking was anything under 10 drinks a day for men and women. So if you live long enough and stay in the sector, you will see change. So I'm, I'm sharing that with you so you don't despair about ever seeing change. Um, my, my role as the social worker in particular was to take care of, and that was the term that was used, of the family members who sometimes came uh, to the clinic both family members seeking help for themselves and families where the drinker, in most cases, was not willing to come to treatment, but also seeing whoever came along with the drinker when, when someone else was sitting on the, on the wooden stools outside. And as a result of that, I got quite interested and quite involved in what could we be doing for these younger people? Well, two things. What do we need to be doing with the kids, the partners and the children of the people coming here to the alcoholism clinic? But secondly, what might we have done if we'd recognised something much earlier on and intervened then, before this got so entrenched with so much physical illness, social disruption, legal trouble, economic despair? So as a result of that, fairly early on in my career, I offered a paper at what was then the only national forum for alcohol and drug stuff at what was then the St Vincent Summer School of Studies on, on Alcohol in Melbourne, on the need for a focus on youth and young people and servicing youth, both the children of those who were already our patients or clients and other potential young people who one day would become clients of our sorts of services. And I had occasion to have a look back at that, the sort of funny old typed on the old typewriter notes from it recently as I'm trying to sort out stuff. And I read the, a paragraph at the end where I said something like, while this is revolutionary, unusual and strange, because no one was talking about kids at that time, I said, I can sort of imagine that we might even be talking about older people sometime in the future. And I guess my challenge to everyone here is try and hang in there long enough till we see what we've seen around young people for older people. That is a reasonable and appropriate focus, some new knowledge, new ideas and new energy and a commitment to caring. Good luck.